All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Metaverse Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Traplin, and today we're going to talk about uh, the allocation situation, the way things have been going for the past, I don't know, few years, and just the way uh, the way distribution seems to be working right now. We're going to go over, uh, we're going to read through a post that uh, Dave Salisbury, the owner of Fanboy3, he put up on Facebook uh, as of this morning. Uh, it was a really insightful, uh, very... Uh, relevant to what's going on right now. We're just going to go through it and and have a little conversation about the situation and maybe come up with some ideas as to uh, the way the allocations should be handled, right? Uh, But before we do that, I just wanted to mention and point out that we are five days away from the LGS Success Summit, September 7th to 9th. So just next week, uh, we are running the three-day virtual summit that you can attend to learn how to sell more games, build a profitable and thriving community of passionate customers, and grow your friendly local game store. It's three days of content, uh, 20 plus speakers from game store owners and publishers and people who've been in the industry for decades. If you added up everyone's experience, it probably be well over 100 years in the business. Uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. The first day is going to be mainly focused on starting a new game store uh, and more uh, newbie friendly strategies and and things that you need to know to get your new business off on the right foot. Game two or day two is going to be all about marketing and uh, growth strategies. So we're going to be talking about SEO and email and social media and content, all kinds of great stuff. Uh, And then day three is going to be all about systems and processes and uh, the things that you need to be able to grow your business uh, from a hiring perspective or from a uh, more of a legacy kind of thought. Uh, things that you need to be able to step away from your business at some point in the future so that you can continue to work on your business rather than always working in your business. So it's kind of, be, uh, it's kind of meant to uh, have content for all levels of experience. Uh, if you are brand new, we got lots of stuff for you. If you've been in the business for a long time, hopefully we'll have uh, some new things, some new strategies that we can uh, we can share with you. Uh, but you can grab your free ticket right now. All you got to do is go to lgssuccesssummit.com and register. Put in your information. We'll send you the free ticket right away. You'll get all you need to be able to tune into the broadcast live. Uh, and uh, be able to learn everything that, well, maybe not everything that you need to know, but a lot of the things that you need to know to be able to grow your business in 2021 and 2022. So that's just something I wanted to point out a little bit before we get into the post today. Uh, remember, go get your ticket. It's a, It'll be a lot of fun. It'll, it was a great time last November, and this one is going to be even better. So really excited for the LG Success Summit. All right, so really quickly, let's go into this post and let's just talk about it. So this was nine hours ago. I'm recording this on September 2nd. Uh, if you're curious and you're not watching the video. So let's just uh, you know, let's just get into it. So Dave says, it's allocation time again. Pokemon 25th. Everyone wants it, but there's not enough to go around. If that sounds familiar, you probably work in games retail. Pokemon has been something of a holy grail for retailers these past couple of years. But the more we sell, the more people want to ram their snouts in the Poke trough. You know, there, there are quite a few Poke puns in this post. So enjoy. If you are a bedroom seller, here's your opportunity to make bank and pay for your own hobby. So there's suddenly twice as much demand for product. If you're a supermarket, you want that hot product too. All those years when you wouldn't return the buyer's call, suddenly you were calling them. Send me more poke pallets and send me, send them now. I need to stack my poke products next to my rutabagas and I need to stock them in depth so people can steal them stat. So what's a distributor to do? And I think this is where the real crux of the question is, what is a distributor to do? What is fair? How do you allocate product as a distributor? And I think Dave makes a really good point here. So I'm a store in central Manchester. We started running Pokemon in 2004. We were one of the oldest continuously running leagues. And in terms of pre-release, I think we are the second biggest allocation in the country. We don't sell Pokemon online and we don't market up. But since 2004, we now have three stores within one minute of us us, that also stock Pokemon. Go 20 minutes out and there are another three. Go an hour out and there are more than 50. Uh, They did not spend 17 years building Manchester's Pokemon community. Support for a community is support for a brand. Pokemon hasn't been a get-rich-quick scheme for us. We don't even sell it online. Too many bots were hanging us up trying to buy all of our stock. Now, many stores consider this as good. One of my friends was complaining about his allocation of Pokemon ETBs being 5% of his order. 
Uh, but while we doubled our orders last year, he pre-ordered 5,000 expecting to flip them. This is why we can't have nice things. You can see the community support axis in two ways, community growth over time and financial expenditure over time. A store that is consistently growing its play community in store is one that sees both axes grow over that time period because more players equals more products sold. And if you don't sell online, those are physical products sold to your physical community in your physical store. Let's go back to the fact that there are three stores within one minute of me, none of whom run and support Pokemon. One means of allocating would be to give everyone the same amount of stock. That way it's fair. My huge organized play focused store in the city center with multiple staff and a 17 year long history of both event support and financial support, of both Pokemon and my distributor would exactly, it would get exactly the same number of packs and boxes as my local post office or that bedroom seller with a VAT number. And this is where I have some sympathy for online stores and bedroom sellers because we're all selling blind. People buy from us because they can guarantee getting the stuff they pre-ordered. Only now they can't. We're all oversold. Products is going to be allocated because the supermarkets quite fancy it. Because stores that would have previously sold a booster box now want their full allocation on everything so that they can flip it. Normally, I'd have done the work and got the reward. My pre-release kit allocations are the proof of our hard graph these past 17 years. Normally, a release is a huge pre-release weekend, followed by a huge chunk of box sales. We don't pad our pre-orders. We don't flip our product. If I sold 10K of Pokemon last set, I have customers lined up that I built as customers for 10K of the next set. Only I'm not getting 10K because I'm not I'm getting a quarter of that. And so are the three stores, the six stores, and the 50 stores. Most of those guys did nothing for 17 years. They weren't cheering the little electric hamster dude on all those long years set after set. And here's what happens on day one. All of my stock has sold out to pre-order and then some. We're being allocated to a quarter of what we had already been given a maximum allocation of. So people come in, we tell them we have sold out to pre-order. And that's fine, right? Because there are three other stores, one of which doubled the prices on Pokemon. Instead of selling what I consider to be the allocation I've spent 17 years building, I'm sending those players to stores in the game, with stores with less in the game who like free money, and that money is mine. I laid the groundwork for it by building solid foundations for my business. I built the community. I built that on trust, the trust that the, that an ATB that is listed at 52 pounds and 50, 50 cents so, uh, yeah, 50 to 50 pounds is going to actually be 52 pounds and 50 cents. I built that on reputation and that we have the largest allocation of pre-release kits. So we are the biggest and best place to go for pre-release. We built the community brick by brick, player by player, event by event. Other stores couldn't, could have done that, but they didn't. Half their space is an event space. To them, this is just free money and they price accordingly for even freer money. But the difference is next year, I currently will still be buying that much Pokemon or more. All a flat allocation does is demolish a floor of my building. But it's a distributor sat on the thing like Myri Cyrus who is wielding the wrecking ball. Here's the thing. You know who your best brick and mortar Pokemon stores are because they have big pre-release pre allocations. These stores have communities that they serve that, like me, took many long years to build up to where they are. How many in-store Pokemon leagues are there? 50? Sure, we had a pandemic and things are tough all around. Nobody knows what those numbers really look like right now. Those communities didn't go. There are real, real players, real stores, real support long-term. So I'm asking the industry to rethink its strategy on allocation. One size doesn't and shouldn't fit all. Just as we support our communities, distribution should prioritize support for us because our growth was real. We're the poke cake, not the poke souffle. That's a good pun, I like that one. And next year, all of those people will have moved on to sell the next hot thing. Maybe it's collectible novelty toilet seat covers, but we will still be there supporting you, supporting our players, and supporting Pokemon as a brand and lifestyle. Give us the tools that we need to do that. So I think this is a really good post right now. And I think this is a very relevant thing to the CCG industry as a whole. The idea of allocating a flat amount to whoever buys the most or not even a flat amount the idea of just saying okay you got you know if you're a distributor and you're saying you know i've got a thousand two thousand five thousand i have got ten thousand booster boxes of a particular set release and i've got a hundred stores that you know want product i'm going to give each one max a hundred right if that's that's your your go-to style uh that is not serving your best customers obviously 
But the problem is you're also using the wrong metric even now, right? Generally speaking, distributors measure allocations based off of like prior past orders, right? So the, the business that is spending the most money with that distributor is probably going to get the highest allocation. And that on its own is like, it makes sense from a financial standpoint. It makes sense from a short-term standpoint. But I would argue that like Dave is saying in his post is that that is not a good long-term strategy. The problem here is, and I'll just uh, quickly put my face on screen. Yeah, no, there we go. There we go. So the problem here is, is that the game doesn't exist. I think this is one of the points that Dave is making in his post. The game, Pokemon, especially since that's the subject right here, uh, Pokemon, the game doesn't really exist. At least the card game doesn't exist without the shops that are promoting it, without the shops that are supporting it, doing the leagues, doing the events, building the, the community, teaching new players how to play. Like without that, and without that of ha being the case, like you said, for the past 17 years, without him doing that, there would not be a community in his area for all those businesses to sell to. So all these all these establishments that are getting all of these booster boxes and an attempt to flip them because they realize that you know this thing's a hot hot commodity, they are going to be able to purchase these and move them real quick and make a you know sizable profit doing it, most likely. Uh, they know that they're going to be able to sell to those players because Dave's already put in the work. He's already created the community. He's already created the, the demand that, you know, the supply is serving. Uh, and if that's the way things are going to go for the future, it's eventually going to eat away at the goodwill of those stores who are creating the support. Now, they'll always, you know, like this isn't going to be a, a complete like death spiral right? If the, if stores like Dave's are getting allocated, that doesn't mean that they're getting nothing, right? That doesn't mean that the products are, or the community that he's built up is not going to get what they want. It's just, they're going to get less of what they want and they're going to go other places to get it. Uh, unfortunately, that means that uh, for Dave, you know, like you said, this is money that he should be able to make. This is, these are products that he should be able to sell in his store to the community and customers that he's built up. Not, uh, building on behalf of another business for somebody to potentially sell booster boxes at uh, near cost prices out of their bedroom. That's, that's a little unfair. And I think that's really the key point here is what is a fair way of handling the situation? Supplies are limited. That's always going to be the case with something like Pokemon. The demand has been explosive for the past couple of years. Now things have been really good. But that means that there's a lot of people who want this product. There's a lot of people who want access to these, these cards and there's just not enough to go around. So you have to figure out a way to fairly and to, to recognize the contributions that businesses have made, that people have put in that made this game what it is today, that got it to this point. And I think what he's basically saying is that there should be two ways of measuring allocation. Instead of just order size, right? If uh, one business is ordering 5,000 booster boxes and another business is ordering 500, that shouldn't be the only consideration that's happening. Distributors should be measuring the, the contribution to gameplay. And I think this is, this is where the WPN program has got it right. Right. This is one of the reasons why uh, Wizards has, has been so successful is because they do take that in, into consideration. Pokemon's a bit of a different beast because of the nature of the game. It's more mass market. It's, you know, virtually everyone on the planet knows who Pikachu is. Almost nobody other than the uh, really dedicated, enfranchised people know who Jace the Planeswalker is. Right. Like that's that's a big difference. But uh, Wizards has done it really well. In this regard, they know who their best brick and mortar stores are. They recognize them. They recognize uh, them with the WPN program. They have metrics for measuring new players who are joining the game. They have measure, uh, metrics for measuring active players. Uh, and they directly influence what kind of support you get as a store uh, in terms of uh, like allocations from the publishers, from themselves, from direct uh, wizards, as well as additional uh, like price support and bonus stuff. All of that's taken into account. 
And I think that is probably the most fair way that we can do this is that there needs to be two, two metrics, two ways of looking, looking at this. Uh, maybe <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated, but maybe merged into one, uh, one Uber metric, one over metric that kind of says, okay, well you spent X, X number of dollars on the last release, but you know, you also activated so many, you created so many new customers. You, uh, your last event, you, you sold so many tickets to your tournaments or something along those lines. So we know that you have created this community. You are providing a service for this community that ensures future demand for product. And you should be rewarded for that because without service providers, without game stores that are like real brick and mortar game stores that are creating the leagues that are creating the events and running the organized play programs, it reduces the pie for everybody eventually like not immediately like if dave decided he's going to close his doors and he's done with fanboy 3 and this thing is finished like those customers aren't going to suddenly just disappear but there's going to be a drastic decline in the amount of play the amount of interest uh when you shut down that kind of a community when you eliminate its ability to function and play and enjoy its hobby uh there's going to be a natural decline in their you know interest in that product right so if all i, I have made the argument before that if all the game stores in the world were to suddenly close today, they just decide that, you know, this wasn't a business. I'm going to go open a, a car dealership. Uh, I'm going to go do something else, a grocery store, literal uh, plumbing. <laughs> I'm going to do some trades. You know, like if all of those entrepreneurs and game stores, game store owners decided that uh, they're just going to walk away and we're going to shut things down, you know, doors closed, no more game stores. If that happened, games like Magic, games like Pokemon, would still continue. There would still be people playing those games. There'd still be avenues of purchasing. People would still be buying stuff from Amazon and Walmart or wherever they can get their hands on it. Uh, the distribution would be really, really weird for a while there, but it wouldn't disappear. There would still be stuff happening. There'd still be activity. There'd still be players. There'd still be a community. It would just be dispersed. And then what would happen is six months to 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, we would see a very sharp, well, maybe not sharp, but a very gradual decline in the amount of people playing that game just because there's no community. There's no place, there would be no place to go to learn about those cards, to talk to your friends about the new stuff that's happening, to, to play your new deck with random people who are also just interested in playing games. Uh, all of that would go away and there would be a general gradual decline to, I don't know, I want to say like 1990 levels of, of game ad, game adoption, right? Like when we were younger, when I was younger, because I'm only 35, when I was younger, games, when I was a kid before the game store, before knowledge of what a game store was and what that kind of a community was, uh, the games that I would play would be like Monopoly and it'd be every once in a while with my family. There wouldn't be any, there, there was no pursuit of anything new. There was no, you know, like constant uh, interesting release schedules to keep track of. There was no real desire. It was just like, oh, you know, it's a game that you, you play it every once in a while. That is the function that game stores provide in the business, in the world, in the community. That's what they do is they create the desire. They create the demand for these games. So if game stores were to go and they were going to shut their doors, trading card games like Pokemon and Magic, would gradually decline. I, I I would argue that at some point they would probably disappear altogether. I don't think they would they would last. I don't think they would exist without this layer of organization that is the retailers, that is the game stores that are creating these these programs and putting in this effort to create a community of customers that constantly want to enjoy their hobby and play new games. And we need, I think, distributors can really do a lot more in recognizing their contribution. The actual going about doing that might be a little bit more complicated than it sounds. No, because if you can just look at the receipts on someone's order and say, well, they spent this much, they spent 10K last time, you know, let's, we'll give them 10K's worth this time, right? Or no more, no less, or you break it down on ratios depending on how much they've spent over the total amount that you've uh, received as a distributor and you figure it out that way. If that's your way of measuring it, uh, that's not taking into account the whole picture. As an industry, I think we really need a lot more transparency. We need a lot more communication. We need ways of understanding what everyone else is doing so that we can better work together. I think that's something that we can take away from this. 
like, again, I want to reference the WPN in the way that they've structured things. I think they have it right. They know what they're talking about. They've, they've established a great program that really does measure a local game store's impact on their community and it rewards them well, maybe not perfectly. It's a work in progress as everything always is, but it's certainly better than just saying, well, you spent, you know, you spent $20,000 in the last release. So that's all you're getting this time, or maybe like 21 or 22,000. It will give you a 10% extra and see how, see how you deal with it. If that's the only thing that they would measure, uh, then Amazon sellers would be de decimating. Just they would be getting the whole allocation. Everybody would be going to Amazon because that's where you that's that's where they would go. You'd be able to flip it for an extra dollar per box, and somebody would be moving moving five thousand, ten thousand boxes at a fraction of a <laughs> of a price just to make make it all up in volume. But like I said, long term, the game dis the game will die. All trading card games will decline without supporting the game stores that make them what they are. So those are my thoughts. I thought uh, Dave's post was really, uh, really relevant to what's going on right now. Uh, I'm sure if you're listening to this and you're, you know, you're in the business, you're probably thinking, oh man, like I really wish I could get more, some, some more Pokemon cards myself. Uh, what do you think about distribution and allocation? How is it impacting your business? You know, what is it, what is it, how is it affecting you? Am I way off base with my assessment on the community? Does it matter that much? Is it just, you know, I just want to know your thoughts. Let me know what you think about this. I would be happy to have a conversation with somebody, but that's my thoughts right now. I think Dave's on, spot on with the way, with his assessment of the situation. And I think there's a lot of things that we can do uh, just as a collective, as a group, all working towards the same sort of thing, playing in the same kind of sandbox. Uh, there's a lot that we can do to better work together and make everyone's boat rise a little bit higher. So those are my thoughts today. Uh, if you want to communicate with me, if you want to send me an email, you can always do that. Tom at maniversaga.com. Uh, if you haven't signed up for your LGS Success Summit ticket, please do. Come join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be you and hundreds of other game store owners. Great opportunities for you to interact with the speakers to ask them questions there are q a's after every session uh it's going to be an it's just an excellent opportunity to learn new strategies to grow your game store whether or not you've opened the doors or not or if you've been in business for 10 years there's always something new to learn and there's always it's always a great opportunity to just meet new people and interact with your peers it's a lot of fun so go to lgssuccesssummit.com grab your ticket today and uh and yeah we'll we'll talk to you again not only will I talk to you again in the next episode, I will see you at the LGS Success Summit in five days. Make sure you go get your ticket. All right, talk to you guys later.